Uh, right, so for the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I just wanted to talk to you about some of the really exciting things um, that have happened, uh, take you through a bit of the um, history of nature, really, for our area. I'd like to start really, though, by saying a big thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today um, and to really talk about some of the fruits of a partnership between the Wildlife Trust the cultural heritage and the geological heritage has gone on for more than 30 years to deliver something very special. And that is the, the Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark, a territory recognised now as a UNESCO world-class uh, natural and cultural heritage area. Um, so without further ado, the talk's going to go through uh, very briefly the perceptions that people have of the way the Black Country was, um, what it's like today, then I'd like to look at that journey through time to bring people up to speed with the past ecosystems and what they've left us as a legacy of landscape, soils and climate. Um, and then maybe for some of those who may not have heard the term global geopark, what one is, what ours is about, and then where we might go with all of this. And again, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end um, on anything that comes up that you think might be interesting. So the traditional um, perceptions about the black country, if you ask most people, it's it's the one that was delivered by the statement of Lee Burry. That he was the American consul to Burning in the mid-1800s. He visited the black country in its heyday of industry and he described it as this landscape, blackened by day and red by night. He wasn't the only one who got that impression of this landscape. This is from Queen Victoria's diary when she was a 13 year old girl and she described it in very emotive terms by saying it's a country that's desolate everywhere. There are coals about and the grass is quite blasted and black. The men, women, children, country and houses are all black. She added but I cannot by any description give her an idea of its strange and extraordinary appearance. So clearly that was a landscape that was a little bit challenging to the more natural aspects. Um, is that black country today? Well, where is the black country today? Well, for a start, it's an area of 356 square kilometres that includes the boroughs of Dudley, Sandville, Warsaw and the city of Wolverhampton. Uh, and if you know anything about our area, you'll notice it's still quite strongly urban. But I think it would be very wrong to call it black anymore. It's remarkably green. Um, I think the density of population gives us many opportunities and some challenges, as I have no doubt. So I'm telling Granny I just okay on that one. Uh, we have our pressures. Um, interestingly enough, studies of the demographics have identified 200 separate communities within the Black Country. Um, and they're based around traditional industries and the kind of lifestyles that grew up around them. Uh, the, the fact that it's green, the, the population is cheap by general with the national and natural wonders, uh, is exemplified by this aerial photograph of Wren's Nest National Nature Reserve. So you can see there, there is a green opportunity, an oasis, right in the middle of a lot of families, 5,000 families back on to that particular green reserve. Another real advantage is the blue networks, of course, which is unique. 170 kilometres burning in the black country. And that literally is twice as much as uh, Venice. And in the summer, they certainly smell a bit better. Um, of course, one of the things that the area is very famous for is the industrial innovation and the fact that it was the biggest and earliest of the large industrial collaborations in the world. So that idea of innovation and invention, <clears throat> you could take that through to the geopark as an innovation if you like. It is something that's written into our DNA. And of course, because it has this long history of a natural landscape being built over millions of years with a very diverse um, set of climate conditions and biodiversity, then you end up, even as the encroachment of industry and population occurs, with these tiny little dots of hidden 
heritage, gems of hidden heritage dotted all around the place, which are just exceptional on a world class scale. You, you just pop up on the green network, the blue networks, to see views that you just don't expect in such a dense urban area, such as this, this view of the Stourbridge Canal just above the Red Earth Pass going words of it. And of course, the other thing that's grown up in connection with that industry is the pride of place. That's not just a distinctive landscape, but a real pride of um, a sense of purpose in who you have been. So let's have a look at how we built the landscape. So how did the landscape build? Well, it is an entirely natural process. And you could argue that the human end of that is still part of a natural progression of life. But we have these exceptional windows that tell us a huge story about the way the black country came to be. And we base this very forensically and quite coldly as scientists on evidence. And the evidence is quite spectacular. So for those of you that might not know this stuff, I'll just show you some pretty pictures and build up that story over the next few slides. So the deepest layers of rock, the oldest layers of rock down there are limestone layers rich in diverse marine fossils. So here you've got the standard stuff like the Dudley Bug and some of the seashells, the brachiopods and some of the corals. The oldest chain ever made in the black country is that one in the top right hand corner of this slide, which is a chain coral, a thing called Palisite. And that's 428 million years old. So maybe nothing's new in innovation, maybe something we're just relearning, who knows? Uh, but the key to this slide is the exceptional preservation. The environmental conditions at the time these things were living that allowed these things to transfer through to our time, time travel, tra beautiful time travel is in exceptional detail. A really good example of that is on the bottom left of this slide, where you can see the inside part of the shell, which retains all the detail of where the muscles attach to that shell, or the bottom picture is a trilobite's head, Dalmanite, and you can see each individual lens on the compound eye of that trilobite. Some of this stuff is extremely delicate too, so its preservation requires very special conditions. So you can see in the main picture here, it's a very delicate feather starfish essentially, things called crimes, um, and these things would normally, in normal conditions in the modern marine setting, break up after about four days. So these things are truly exceptional. And it's not just the large fossils. We started to study the micro fossils, the microscopic world, the plankton of those ancient seas. And this is a study that hopefully will publish this year, which shows some of the exceptional preservation of even the very tiny. These things are fractions of a millimetre. The jawbone on the left hand side is only a tenth of a millimetre long, but it's as you can see, it's a very voracious predator's uh, mouthpiece for, for a marine worm, I think, called the Scalucinomus. So the preservation is exceptional and it captures the, the entire flavour, if you like, of the ecosystem that built the limestones. So we can rebuild that earliest um, community of the Birmingham Black Country area, which is a coral reef, diverse. But it only had the very earliest of vertebrates. So this is very early on in the game of complex life. And where were we? Well, the story of building the Black Country landscape is one of travel across the planet too. So if we go back to a reconstruction by Chris Gortiz, who's a colleague in New Mexico University, who did a pay on that project, who pulled together evidence, pieced together the way the world looks. Then um, we have an image here that shows the that is where our landscape was. And it was actually south of the equator. And when you piece together the whole information about where the planet looked back then, you can see it's quite different because there are a huge variety of land masses di very differently distributed to today, but also there's no ice sheets. The world was a lot warmer back then. So that was the earliest rock layer. But if we move up a notch, we come into the one that the, the, the black country, the coal field, is very 
famous for, which is the, the coal seams, the carboniferous rocks. And despite the fact that we've got lots of plant fossils and coal seams, there's a huge variety of other exceptionally preserved fossils. So this slide gives you a, a range of those from very delicate plants to dragonfly wings to um, the complexity of worm burrow, segmented worms. But the one that's really special here is the one on the top left, which is a fossil spider monkey called the Trigon of Tarbid. And this thing is exceptionally preserved in an ironstone nodule. It's the best preserved fossil spider mite in the world. And it comes from Coesley in the Black Country, not far, well, between Dudley and Wolverhampton. So we, there's a whole thesis on that, but I'll move on for the sake of uh, uh, time. The industrial side of things adopted the raw mineral, the useful energy mineral side of things. And this is two thirds of the thickest coal seam in the UK that was exposed in Dudley. This is a thing called the thick coal, South Staffordshire thick coal. And um, this is going way back into the 1980s. So you can see that uh, things were done a bit differently back then, but it's an open cast that occurred then. And you can see just what a huge en energy resource all of those fossil plants were. And equally, which is relevant to our time, just how much carbon they took from the atmosphere and sequestered in these coal layers beneath the ground that we are now releasing it. So the, the effects of those forests 300 million years ago, which produced the coal seams, when we were there at the red dots, right in the equator of the planet, the, the effect of that really was to change the atmosphere and cool the planet down. And in many ways, the greatest pollution incident this planet has ever seen was the advent of blue-green algae and the release of poisonous oxygen into the atmosphere. So organisms have always changed the planet and mass growth of organisms spread of any dominant organism impacts the physical being of the planet. You can see here from this diagram, not only did you have these large equatorial forests, taking the carbon out, but you can also see the ice sheet, probably for the first time for 200 million years at the southern pole of the planet. So that's something that has been a very big lesson from the rocks. If we reconstruct exactly where we were at the time, where that Koji spider comes from, the landscape of the UK looked a bit different. There's your equatorial forest, and the equatorial forest is being um, produced and grown in this area that stretches to the north of us. To the south of us is a long land mass, a thing called the Wales Brabant Massif, or St George's Land it's sometimes called. But we're in this steaming swamp to the north of it, growing all of those trees, capturing all that carbon, producing the coal seams that were so important for the industrial times. And when we look at what those coal seams contain, it is not just coal. You occasionally see these stripes cutting up and cutting through and across. And they are actually igneous rocks, molten rocks that were injected into the landscape about 307 million years ago. And they've left a profound effect on the landscape, as we'll see later on. But they also produced a landscape that has changed considerably because of the human activity. So in the left of this, uh, um, particular slide, you can see the hailstone, an etching of the hailstone, which was to all intents and purposes, a granite tour that stood proud in the Black Country landscape until people realised that that hard, hard basalt rock was very good for engineering things and producing road surfaces. And there below it, you've got the hailstone quarries of this today, showing the columns within that basalt as it cooled within the earth. The, this time also gave us uh, occasional breaks through of that magma to the surface to produce small volcanoes, such as the Barrow Hill volcano. And this, again, gives you ash layers which explain that it was a volcano. You've also got the magma channel underneath, preserved with the uh, column of basalts and the contact where it touches the rocks into which it broke through. But you've also got these plant streaks in the ash. 
they turn out to be very important indeed in the story of life on Earth. So if you look at those in detail under the microscope, as Gartier and Waters from the British Geological Survey did in 1981, then you see that they are anatomically preserved. That slow cooking within the volcanic ash preserved the internal structure in microscopic detail. So that you can see here the, the phylum, the phloem and xylem of a very primitive conifer. So this was most unexpected and these are the oldest and best preserved original conifers in the world. So if you take nothing else from my talk today, one thing you can take is that the oldest Christmas trees in the world were invented in the black country. There's another area of, area of innovation for you. Um, of course, the landscape would have looked a bit different back then. And this is what Dudley would have looked like. Uh, a, a kind of mud flat area with lakes with a small eruption volcano. A bit different. If we then move on to the next layers of rocks that become nearer to our time, we find that they turn red and sandy. And these are the ones that surround the Black Country coal field. The edges have these red sandy rocks. Uh, Birmingham is underlain by the very great thickness of these red sandy rocks that, provide, that do provide a huge water supply for, for industry. If we look at this exposure here, which in words, what you can see from the scale of this car's house is that there are uneven layers within this and that sometimes these layers dip down and don't stay nice and horizontal. In fact, what we're looking at here is a fossil sand dune, a very large sand dune that would be comparable to any of the large deserts on Earth today. So the environmental conditions are changing a great deal from marine to swamp to desert. And these rocks would have been produced in a landscape similar to this a basin and range desert such as the ones in the Midwest of Central America. At that time as well, we have a very special moment in the history of planet Earth and the building of the Black Country, because it's a time when all of the land masses on planet Earth clump together. And when they did that, they changed the climate, produced this desert basin to the north, but they also, of course, created a real stress on the living systems of the planet because it changed the ocean circulation, the climate ecology, and it removed huge amounts of coastal regions, so we lost a lot of the shallow seas. That resulted in a catastrophic um, loss of life, the Great Fire, the Permian mass extinction. And many of the former life forms died out. We're familiar with um, mass extinction because of the dinosaurs. I had to put a picture of a dinosaur in there partly because it links through to modern ecosystems such as the birds, but also because it's a dinosaur. Everybody likes dinosaurs. So 66 million years ago, there was another catastrophic dying of the planet, which we don't have any evidence for in our rocks. What it you does, but we don't. So we'll move on. Um, at that time, 66, 60 million years ago, the modern Earth is appearing. So again, if you've not seen any of these reconstructions before, you can begin to see how the movement of the land masses through plate tectonics is beginning to shape our world as we know it, and in doing that, produce the black country. By the middle ear scene, I've put this one in because it is a thing called the, the thermal maximum when global temperatures were as much as 15 degrees higher than today and even the poles were forested in green, very green, lush uh, environments. Um, just as an aside, in case anybody wants to pick up on that later, but we don't have any of those rocks. The final layer, right at the top of the rock pile that produces the black country, are these things. So here is a rock face in a quarry. The bottom bit is those red sandy beds, and then the final layer at the top are these pebbles. These pebbles yield fossils such as this one. Now this one is a mammoth's tooth. It also yielded fossils of hyena and lion in Stourbridge. So the river Stour in 
a time period of about 250 million years to about 10,000 years ago was undergoing significant climate change where woolly mammoths were quite capable of roaming across the frozen black country and then we'd have interglacial periods, climate instability, significant climate instability. So you'd have landscapes in Stourbridge like this that were produced in an icy world like this. 18,000 years ago, we were at a thing called the Devensian Glacial Maxima. And ice sheets north and south spread, as you can see on this diagram, all the way down to Western Europe, uh, low-lying low latitudes such as northern France. So we had real cold spells. So that was a quick whip through the entire geological history of the black country. It gives us a, a rock pile layer, which has lots of different types, different environments, different ecosystems that produces different conditions for us now. Not just raw minerals. The, the raw minerals are spectacular. Here is a column in the middle of this diagram, which shows just how many layers of useful minerals there were in 300 feet of strata contained within a little coal field between Birmingham and Wolverhampton. Nowhere in England has more geological diversity in such a small compass as this region of the Black Country. It is extremely special. So what does that geology do to our landscape? Well, if you look at the patchwork quilt on the left, it's very colourful. There are lots of different rock types here and there. I'd like to focus on the red dot and the blue bits here and across here, because they are the hard limestones and those volcanic vessels. They are so hard, they create the highland ridges and valleys on either side. That significantly affects the and habitats that can be created and grown there as, the, as time passes and climate affects the rocks and generates soil. Let's have a closer look at that. So I'm indebted to the, floor, the publication of the floor of the Black Country for some of the data mapping that was done in there because it gives us these things. So if we look at the rocks in the middle and the highland on these ridges, it inevitably affects winter temperatures, the higher land being quite a lot colder. It also affects the amount of rainfall. So the higher land obviously gets a greater degree of precipitation and then sheds that to create the hydro and hydrology around, hydrogeology around. So if you then plot on the, the headwaters of various streams and how they aggregate together to make them in rivers, we see that we have two significant river valleys. The first is the River Stour to the southwest of the Highland. The second is the River Tain, which is a much more gentle, U-shaped, open valley to the northeast of that ridge. That changes everything. It creates a whole set of different conditions and habitats across our region. The most, one of the most significant interactions between the climate and the topography and the rock type is soil. Again, I apologize if we're telling granny how to suck it, but the soil structures are very different across the black country. Now, I'm sure if Ian Truman's here today, Ian will very much appreciate the significance that can have on the flora, and then that flora can have on um, the biota that feeds on it. So here we've got limestones at Ren's Nest and limestone soil, very calcium rich soil. Here at the portrait site, um, wildlife trust site at Rowley, we have weathered basalt and quite rich, iron rich and magnesium rich soil. Over at Barbican in Walsall, we have the bunt of pebble beds, kidneys to formation, and that gives us very sandy soils, nice acid peatland type soil. And then in Wolverhampton, where we've got this thick cover of glacial clay overlaid by clayey conurbs spoil, we have very clay rich soils, which is subject to getting much more water logged. And then, of course, 
we've come along and added our dimension to all of that. The, the result is, and I'm sure the um, students showing the results that we got last year, which I thought were fantastic, um, showing just what a diversity of urban wildlife we have, um, reflects that complex patchwork point of geology that's led to those complex soils. But we then added a new layer of chemical complexity to with industrialization. And now we've got this wonderful rich diversity. And I'm not going to talk about wildlife to you guys because this is your, your uh, field and I, I'll sound foolish. But I just want to show some pictures that I took during those uh, City Nature Challenge moments or around about that time. And the diversity just, is just stunning. It's just wonderful. Um, I'll shut up there because I'll get into trouble. What I will do is say that it gives us this area a really rich set of protected sites. And so that idea of the Black Country being this derelict wasteland could not be further from the truth. And our job, I suspect, between us all is to connect it together to make it even better and stronger and more valuable. OK, moving quickly on, I'm aware of time. Um, so in terms of the cultural side of this thing, so we've looked at how the natural world has built a landscape then people move in. And rather than talk you through that process as well, let's just look at some of the key things that form the world-class stuff that UNESCO is interested in. So, for example, the first map of what's beneath your feet, the first moment of insight into how you can express what's below your feet and how that changes on a two-dimensional flat piece of paper was done here. It was done in 1665 in this book about iron making. This is the map. Now that doesn't look particularly um, natural, but it is, it's remarkably correct. And each one of those circles is a mineral scene and they, they're identified with Dudley Castle at the center. This is Dudley Castle here. And these are limestone and coal seams wrapping around it. The key to this is that it's got a scale. It actually is a measured quantification of where you will find these seams hitting the surface and how they dive away below. That is a turning point in our understanding of where to go looking for minerals, mineral exploration at its very best. As that started to kick in and people explored the ground below, you needed to go deeper because the ground got waterlogged. So it drove advances such as the world's first effective mines pumping engine, the Newcomen engine, this thing here, which was put in place in 1712. Then, of course, inevitably, if you get more minerals and you've got that energy resource and the thick coal to work with, you create a, a, an environment of entrepreneurial innovation like nowhere else. So we, we have, on Wren's Nest, the birthplace of Abraham Darby, the so-called father of the industrial revolution. And that went on to nearer to our time, but um, huge inventions of great importance for predicting and uh, identifying where earthquakes are occurring, the quantity and timing of earthquake tremors. And this guy here, John Johnson Shaw, invented the world's first practical um, recording seismometer. This thing we take it for granted now that the earthquake trace on a on a on a long piece of paper, but that hadn't been done until the, 19, the early 1920s when this guy invented it in his basement. And it shows you what you have to be to be taken seriously as a scientist. You have to wear a bow tie. Right, um, other innovations, things like this. Um, in the science park in Wolverhampton, we have the place where the, the world's first high-level atmospheric science balloon flight took. If you've seen the film the aeronauts, it didn't happen in London. It happened in Wolverhampton at Stafford Road Gasworks because they got the source of gas. The mammoth is not referring to the Ice Age here, it's referring to the gas balloon that they used to do these experiments. And in those experiments, modern meteorology came about, including the discovery of the jet stream. That's a whole new story as well, so I'll shut up about that one. Um, right, and the other thing, of course, is we had the cultural links to the arts. So all of this natural and uh, inventiveness, human ingenuity, 
creates a unique, if somewhat dark, uh, genre of art. Heavy metal music was invented here. Some of the classic films and a lot of the paintings and, and uh, artwork reflects those harder urban industrial times. Um, so uh, there is a cultural diversity here which springs from those industries which spring from the geological and natural diversity. So you end up with um, that reflected in the landscape. And here's a few pieces of artwork that I've chosen in the public realm, which just reflect how many of those natural themes and those themes related to the exploitation of natural resources you get scattered about the place. And if we had more time, we could do a quiz on this to see how many of you actually know where these things are. Um, but I'll move on. Ultimately, that gives you an incredible heritage menu of hidden gems scattered across a region of 356 square kilometers. That is a set of assets that can be used to inspire. It is unique, so it can be used to uh, for education, for as a, as a selling point for sensitive inward investment and sustainability for the future. That's what the geoparks about. So in the last few minutes, we're going to talk about that. So what is a geopark? What's the geo bit of the geopark? What, where are they? Well, at the moment in the UK, there are seven. And there they are scattered. Shetlands, Northwest Highlands, North Pennines, Marble Arch, Anglesey, Brecon Beacons and Torbay. Each of those is defined in this way. They are large and unique. I don't think anyone would argue that North Pennines is not a unique landscape and, and the 200 islands of the Shetland. So they large, unique landscapes. Importantly, it is holistic celebration. It's not just one aspect. It's not the specialism of one, the, the realm of another. It is the, the whole thing together that creates the unique space. One thing that UNESCO insists on is that it has that link to these ancient worlds. It has those special windows that tell us about the, the planet and how it's got to where it is. So they ask for internationally important geological and related heritage. So you can see from the pictures I've shown you today just how special the black country geology is and why it qualifies. Um, I guess what they are, these geoparks, is a mechanism to capture it, package it together, to sum total it for the benefit of all. So if we just thought about one aspect, such as archaeology, it wouldn't be as strong a rope as if you wrapped it with biology and geology, and then you get a really strong heritage rope that's much more robust and sustainable. There's no point having all of that stuff unless you're going to protect it. So the other side to this is you have to have conservation and protection. And people who care and get stuck in couldn't be in better company today with you guys for that one. Um, so you've got to have a sensible strategy, you've got to have people who care, and you need to look after these things, or what's the point of giving you a designation that's going to fail? Um, so sustainability, and that sustainability element, element in the modern context of environmental sustainability and quality of life is really important. So in many ways, these are places with a vision for the future, as much as they are about what's here now. It is about building something strong for the future and sustainable with all the right messages. If you look at Europe, there's quite a scatter of them. So they go from Iceland, Finland, uh, Norway, all the way down to the margin of Africa down there in southern Spain. If you look at the world, then there's 161 of them. It isn't evenly distributed because the geology is not evenly distributed. However, it's also political. This is a UNESCO thing, it's a United Nations thing. So some of the distribution is simply down to communications and politics. That is slowly being sorted out through time. I should say as well that an awful lot of them were, uh, were very wild nat natural landscapes. And so we've come into this as a very urban um, natural area, 
which is, I think, going to shake things up a little and maybe take things forward in new directions. Right, here we are. We did it. I wanted to celebrate with you today because last year two wonderful things happened. One is this. We became a UNESCO territory in July, on July the 10th last year, which is wonderful. This is our new badge. So we are now officially a World Heritage Area, which is wonderful, part of the UNESCO family. We have an obligation now to share our knowledge, to share our wisdom, to share, share our uh, expertise managing things in a complex urban area. Um, we also have some UNESCO obligations, United Nations obligations to flow with. And this, I suspect, I don't know, but if you've not seen these before, there should be some smiles to be had. These are the 17 sustainable development goals. So these are the things that take forward development in a sustainable way. And I, as environmentalists, we're all worried about this, I know. Um, and, and so we are using these things to benefit our populations and to take things forward in a, a much more better and sensitive way than we've ever done before. So let's have a closer look at these and just drawing a, a, just a couple. I'd like to highlight just a couple of these. Um, so, for example, how do we fit with the United Nations main goals? Well, I think if you look at things like um, this one here, health and well-being, I think we can all tick that box. Uh, then as you go across these, quality education. Well, the more we connect people with landscape and the natural environment, the better things will go forward. Clean water. Then you've got energy supply down here. What about that one? Climate Number 13, climate action, life in water and life on land. So you can see that everything we're doing anyway is contributing to this. And actually, because of being a world recognized heritage area now, we can start to bring these things higher, our higher and more forcefully into the agendas of development. And we're doing for time. I need to shut up, don't I? So very quickly then, um, with a big team, we put this together over a long period of time. This process took 10 years. And thankfully, our partnerships with your good selves has been a wonderful, fruitful partnership. And going forward, I expect it's going to be even better with more exciting projects. Those are the partners. We had to select geoscience to define what we are. And these are the mixture that we've already described. So you can see they're accessible and they're managed on the whole, but they have to have the very special sites in there for certain things. It's not the be all and end all. We've got a headquarters in Dublin. We have the one of trusts site. Geosite 23 is the portway site, which is absolutely wonderful. If you haven't had the chance to visit this one, do come and see us in the summer. It's just wonderful. Um, RSPB, Sandra Valley. Wren's Nest, of course. Um, Bar Beacon, Pinfold Lane, the viewpoints up there, the Dudley Volcano, Wolverhampton West Park, scattered with all its glacial boulders and its Victorian Park heritage. And then you've got Walsall Arboretum, a celebration of arboriculture. And then you've got the canal networks and the blue, the blue networks being represented. And that leads to sustainable infrastructure. This is a new hotel that was opened last year in Dudley, coated in emblems of local heritage. Here's the new housing estate on Wren's Nest. Fossil view, Silurian views after a period of geological time, calamine after the Dudley bug. The fences have even got trilobites um, pasted onto them. New interpretation is part of this. Having all these things you need to tell people. And so we're generating a few trails, we're putting in the new bespoke signage, using the UNESCO branding, producing new leaflets. That's going to have some quite interesting, I think, interpretive material about what's beneath your feet. There's a whole suite of these coming forward, the booklets, and we just rebranded our website and updated our website. So if anything I've said today has, has sparked a bit of interest, do go and visit the website. There's all sorts of info on there. You can find all the lots of things to see and do. Um, but what are the next steps? Finishing off, this is my last slide. Uh, the need to collect this together, we need to bring it together to improve 
how you get about the place and, and what you can find out when you're there. We need to have more stuff to go into education. And I think we need to grow those educational products. So the stuff you do is just exceptional, it's wonderful. And it engages volunteers and professionals, it engages businesses. I think we need more of that for the geopark side of things as well. Um, obviously, we want to strengthen the community links and build in more um, ownership of a lot of this and innovation. And I think the new tools to engage people. So we're going to use new technology. This is the headquarters that was 3D scanned. And now if you visit the website, you can walk around the headquarters in the museum without, even in COVID times, you can see what we've got in there. There's, there's little video clips and things to help you. So the hopes for the future are simply that we grow this geopark park for the benefit of everybody, that we connect people much more strongly to the landscape, that we encourage people to come and see what we're about and invest in sustainable futures with us and develop things which are much more sensitive than they have been in the past. And the black country really does make that transition from the black to the green. And with that, I'll shut up. So thank you ever so much for listening. We could hand back now to Emma um, uh, and I'll take any questions that we've got left in the minutes or the lectures. So I'll shut up there. <laughs>